not so easy. I mean, I never, you know, I ever did obvious answer at school. Of course not. But yet, the behavior that we often uh, show is, 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 is of that, is of really just being followed, just moving along, going along with the flow. Um, but if we are going to follow along, we should follow Jesus. So um, we travel by faith in Christ. That's what we're called to do, to have faith in him. Um, and in faith, we give Christ control. So really the idea here of Jesus take the wheel is of you letting go of how you want to do something. You letting go of how you think this has to be done and really putting your, your hope and your faith in Jesus. And that's not always easy to do, as we know. Um, a lot of complicated problems sometimes we have to deal with in life, and it's not always easy to see the clear answer. But if we focus on Christ and His Word and see what wisdom we can find in Scripture, and try to do as the wristbands always say, "What would Jesus do?" Um, then we're certainly allowing Him to guide us. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him. And he will make your paths straight. So it's really about that giving yourself over. It's not your own control. There's nothing in there that says, and you keep a bunch of control. No, you keep a little control. No, it says, trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Yeah, but I know this is the way that it works. Yeah, but what did the Lord say? We're going to do it the Lord's way. We're going to lean on your understanding and then go the right direction. That's usually what happens. Um, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists, and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So really, faith is being the utmost important thing. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. We have to put our trust in him and allow him to lead our life. But it's not always easy um, for that to happen. We have some things that kind of interfere with faith, right? Um, in the case of driving, right, there's a fear, right? If you've ever been in the car with someone, especially a beginner driver, we got a few beginner drivers amongst us. Tessa just started going to her classes for the, for, um, what's it called, the, you know, driving school. And getting in the car with a beginner driver is, is scary. Had I known that Slava, I'd never driven before. I wouldn't even have even tried. On some of those mountain roads around Grand Canyon, no way. I wouldn't even try it. Um, so fear um, often gets the best of us and interferes with our faith. We have a, a few great examples, but one in particular I was going to point out from Scripture. As we know, Peter tried to walk on water, and he goes out there, and he actually succeeds for a bit. But then he lets fear overcome him, and his fear diminishes faith, and he starts to sink. And he was rebuked for that. And then here we have a, a similar instance, but this is with everybody else. And there's something a little extra here that I wanted to point out, which is why I chose this one. But it says, leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was, um, just as he was in the boat. Uh, there were also uh, other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him up and said, uh, said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So as they're sitting in the boat, we've read this and probably imagined it in a lot of different ways, but they're sitting there and the, the, the big question that kind of comes up is, don't you care if we drown? And it's funny how fear will interfere with our ability to think. They've seen Jesus perform miracles. They've seen Jesus do amazing things. They, they know that he has power. They know that he cares. They seem to go around and heal people and care for others. So it's kind of a silly question. Do you not care if we drown? Well, I mean, I didn't call you to be disciples for nothing, right? Just to let you drown here, right? That was, that was not my purpose and my mission. Um, but that short-sightedness uh, came into play because of the fear. And then Jesus answers, why are you so afraid? 
do you still have no faith? So he directly attributes that fear to a lack of faith. And so when we're tackling the road to heaven and we're trying to let Jesus lead and him take, take the wheel and be the one leading, um, that faith um, is necessary for him to do that. We start allowing that fear to settle back in. Um, we're, we're not going to we're not going to let him have full control of the wheel. We're going to start trying to grab at it again. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So maybe this is, there's a lot of recipes for how to live with fear, but this is one that I particularly like. Um, when you're anxious and you're feeling fearful and you're worried about a situation, you're not really sure what you should do, or something is happening, um, the best thing to do is to go to the Lord in prayer. Really focus on prayer, petition, talk to, talk to God. Um, release your fears, release your anxieties, let those be known. And then also, with Thanksgiving, present your request to God. Realize all the blessings you have. Coming out of Thanksgiving right now, the time where we're, we're thinking about all the many blessings we have, and we certainly do have many in the Lord. There's another thing, though, that comes up with uh, faith, and that is stubbornness versus faith. And stubbornness is an interesting one. Um, it's kind of a complicated one in some ways if you really want to think about what is stubbornness, what's at the root of stubbornness. There's a few things that can kind of come into play. Um, but a donkey is a pretty stubborn animal, right? Um, it's hard to, to get a donkey to behave. And uh, it's funny because, you know, you know that both these guys probably have the best interests of for this donkey, but the donkey doesn't see it that way. So it's just tag, tugging and tugging and um, and uh, not going to go. And we see that we have a, a lot of cases in scripture of some pretty stubborn people. Um, in Acts 7 51, Paul's talking to, I'm uh, sorry, Peter's talking to, um, to the, the, the leaders of the Jewish nation. He says, You stiff necked people, your hearts and your ears are still uncircumcised. You're just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. They always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given to angels, but have not obeyed it. And they were, they were giving a gift. They were God's people. God's nation, and yet they let that stubbornness into their hearts, whether it be pride, whether it be just no desire to really listen, you know, I think that's a, a big part of it today, because um, if you don't listen, you can't have faith, so it's consequently your faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is through the word about Christ, and, you know, we know the Pharisees, they just didn't even want to hear what Christ had to say, Christ could have just said something just amazing in front of their presence, and and they just didn't hear it. it just went went straight by because they already had their preconceived thoughts, their ideas of what they wanted. They weren't going to listen to it. So completely stubborn and unwilling to listen, unwilling to open their hearts to even allow faith to begin to do its work in their hearts. Um, we have a story of Paul in his conversion. When he's talking to King Agrippa, the king of Acts. He says, "I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic." Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then they asked, Why are you um, who, then, he, then I asked, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. And uh, as you see highlighted there, it's hard to against the goads. If you don't know what a goad is, it's it's basically like a long bar of a spike or two spikes on the end. Uh, there's a few different versions of fashion, but the whole point of it is to poke the animal on them. So, you know, that that uh, donkey you saw earlier definitely could have used to go and to get it moving. All right, what else? A little, bit, a little ah, get you going, right? Um, but also think about the idea of kicking against the goats, all right? That you're just, you're, you're getting goaded, right? But you're kicking back, trying to prevent it. Um, I've always had a visual of like, you know, you kick back and that goat hits your friend in the foot, oh, right? Terrible pain. But the idea is that you keep kicking. Well, what do you think the person's doing? It's continuing to poke. Because every time you kick, you just get poked again. And so it's definitely that, that stubbornness of not learning and not willing to change. And um, 
Paul was certainly in that camp, right? Uh, we talked about uh, Paul being uh, zealous for the Lord. He was. We talked about Paul being 100% committed to the Lord. He was. We talked about Paul doing everything and everything he did for the Lord. And he was. It's just he was going the wrong direction on the road. He was going the wrong way. And he didn't realize that Jesus was who he should be serving. He thought Jesus was someone he needed to get rid of for the Lord's sake. And fortunately, because I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, when he realized the mistake that he made, when he realized the direction he should be going, he made a quick e turn and started heading back in the right direction. Each of you should. Uh, use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful servants, as uh, stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Um, one way to, um, you know, be active, avoid stubbornness, um, keep yourself from being so unoccupied that you have your own thoughts to follow is put, put your, yourself to work, serve others, live for others, um, allow your talents and your abilities um, to go. And just as Paul did, he realized what he was doing wrong, changed direction, and got right to work. Um, staying busy and, and serving others is a, is a great way uh, to be on the journey with the Lord. So persevering on the journey. So you talked a little bit about what it is to, to trust the Lord and head down that path. Um, I want to look about persevering, though. It says, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight of blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in the faith, establish and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. So once you were lost. But now you are found. And there's one third thing. You have to continue down the road. You don't get on the road and just stop. Uh, salvation doesn't stop at baptism. That's where it begins. And there is a journey to continue. Um, but the issue for us, just like we deal with fear, and letting God take control, stubbornness, and willingness to make changes in our lives that we can make, in order for Christ to properly lead us to be in control of our lives. Um, there's also the issue of just being constantly distracted. You know, when you're trying to go down the road and that buzzer keeps going off, oh, it's an important text, I gotta send it out. I mean, in this life, not only is that really, really dangerous, but in your eternal life, that's, that's just terrible. Um, we cannot let those distractions, we have to stay focused on really what is the most important thing we're doing. And there are important texts that come through, but you have to put, balance it out to be okay. But in this case, in this specific situation, what is the most important thing we can do? We have a similar uh, kind of balancing act that happens here in Luke 10 40, where it says, But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care? Well, we saw that earlier, right? Don't you care for them? Don't you care, Lord? It's like, oh, wait, when I'm not paying 100% attention to you, then I don't care? Sounds like what they're saying. Well, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from you know, in this situation, Jesus shows that kind of balancing act that we need to be good at. There are important things in life. Is it important for Martha to prepare? Well, yeah, I'm sure she had something she needed to prepare. She didn't want to leave other people unattended. She didn't want to not serve others. But there is a moment where we always have to sit down and go, well, so wait a second, am I getting distracted in a way that I'm really missing out on something phenomenal? Something that is really super meaningful? The chance to sit down with Jesus and have a conversation with him. And you weigh those situations. Um, you're in a conversation with someone that you just run into and they want to know a little bit about where you go to church. You have an opportunity just to talk to someone about Jesus. And then you get a work text. 
you know, maybe that work text can take away 10 minutes so you can finish that important conversation that has internal consequences before dealing with that text that has momentary meaning. So it's important to, to work on staying on the road once we're kind of headed down that path, really focusing on Jesus and maintaining our focus on him and make sure he's leading the way. We can do so by examining ourselves to see whether you are in faith. Test yourself, or do you not realize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? Um, it's important to analyze ourselves, ask these questions. Um, each one of us has different situations in our life, so what are you dealing with? Where in your life are you not letting Jesus take control? Where in your life are you really clinging on to that steering wheel and saying, no, 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 we got to make a turn over here, um, and you're gaming at that wheel. What are those things to you? Where do you need to get better at letting Jesus take the wheel? Um, I'm sure we have some fans out here, and you probably figured it was going to come up. It's Jesus Take the Wheel is the lyrics of a song on the ground. And um, Natalie and Maddie, um, you're going to like beat me because I'm totally forgetting the name of the artist now. But um, what's her name? Carrie Underwood. Thank you. Underwood. So she has a song, it's Jesus Take the Wheel. And in that story, uh, what happens is that uh, this, this mom with a newborn baby in the backseat of a pickup is headed home, and the uh, weather's bad, and her life's in a, in a wreck, really. I mean, there's no indication there's a, there's a father involved. Um, she's headed back, sounds like she's going to be embarrassed to see her family with this, this baby. And, and she's in the pickup, and maybe the pickup's not even working well. And it's just like everything's falling apart. And she gets into what could be an accident. And fortunately for her, it wasn't an accident. She just isn't inside the road or something. But in that moment, she realizes because of the trauma, what happens? I need to do something in my life that changed course, to change direction. I just can't keep telling what I'm doing. I'm clearly not going the right direction. I'm veering off the road constantly in a spiritual sense. And this physical moment awoke her spiritual sense for her to realize, I need to make a change. I need the Lord in my life. And so she said, Jesus, take the wheel. As in, I'm not going to make those decisions anymore. I don't want to be stuck in the ditch my entire life. So how do I do that? Well, stop grabbing at the wheel, right? I mean, that's what we do. Instead of letting the Lord just lead, we're constantly reaching over and we're grabbing at that wheel. And tell you not and saying, Lord, but don't we need to go this way? No, that's where you want to go. That's not good. I know what's right for you. I know what's best. That's why we have to let the Lord really take take the seat. And um starting to get dark there, maybe. You know, I would be getting sleepy. I don't think Jesus falls asleep with the wheel. Um, we want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end. So that what you uh, so that what you hope for may be fully realized. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those uh, who, through faith and patience, inherit what has been promised. So it's really about um, staying on staying on track, staying focused, not being lazy, doing the work that needs to be done, but being conscious about where you're headed. And just being conscious about letting Jesus take the wheel. Um, when I was letting Slava drive, I was getting sleepy. I was going to fall asleep behind the wheel. I needed to hand it over to someone. Well, I did not choose the right person to hand the wheel over. <laughs> not the right guy. And fortunately, we were doing well. But in life, um, you know, driving at night's not fun. And there's a lot of night in life. There's a lot of times where things get dark. There's a lot of times where we have to make our decisions a lot of times we need that friend in Jesus. And um, when it does go dark, it's kind of interesting. This scripture maybe puts it in a different perspective, but we can't drive in total darkness. We need to like, we need some kind of light to be able to see where we're going. And the reason we shouldn't be driving, Jesus should be driving, driving is because we live by faith and not by sight. Jesus doesn't need to see the road, he knows it already. He's already been there. He's already done that. He's already accomplished it. 
Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says, I'm your honor. You can sit in the passenger seat. I'll take you there. You can come along, enjoy the ride, but you're beautiful. You're beautiful. I made this world for you. And too often, we just want to sit in that seat and just drive and have road rage. It's like, no, oh, look at this. Does that sound wonderful? Like, just take, give it to me. I'll give you rest. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Life hands us the opposite. And somehow we still want it. And we can get rid of it by putting our faith in Jesus, letting him truly take the wheel. Now, one thing I thought about when I was thinking about this is like, well, if we all let Jesus take the wheel, then are we all going to fit in the car to get to heaven? I don't know. So I know the Conakies have a good size van. And, uh, but I don't think we can all fit in the Conakies van. Especially if they're already in there first. So, um, so I'm going to suggest that we budget for a larger bus that can fit more of us. So we can all fit and get to heaven so Jesus can meet us all there. I don't think we'll all fit. I know a lot of a lot of members of the church in Venezuela and in Russia and other places. And so so I'm actually gonna skip that. I think we need to go for the train. And so we can all fit so that Jesus can drive that train and get us home. So Anyway, that's the message for this morning, and I do end it this in kind of a funny way, but I want us all to go to heaven, and we all have to let Jesus lead, and it is true, we got one person driving us all there, and there is a song called Get Right Church that talks about all getting on that train and headed to heaven, right? So let's go ahead and stand as we sing this song this morning. Get right, church, and let's go home. Get right, church, and let's go home. Get right, church, you better get right, church. Get right, church, and let's go home. I'm going home on the morning train. I'm going home on the morning train. I'm going home, you know it, I'm going home. I'm going home on the morning train. Cause that evening train might be too late. Evening train might be too late. Evening train, you know that evening train. Evening train might be too late. So back, back train and get your load. Back, back train and get your load. Back, back train, you better back, back train. Back, back, train, and get your load. Amen. You can have a seat.